just in case anybody's interested, I'm building a 1.9 big bore, which takes them to almost two liters, actually a little better than two liters. Um, got the crank set, put together, got the bearing on, the crank gears down, the snap ring on. Should have shown you how I do that. That's a very simple setup. Um, just a propane torch to warm these up and an aluminum pipe that, that taps them on. They'll just fall on once they get heated up and expanded. Um, rods, I have them rebuilt and resized at Nova Automotive in Dartmouth. They've been my machine shop for quite a few years and they've treated me really good and not one thing, not one thing that I've gotten from them has uh, had to go back for any reason. Everything's been measured perfect and I still plastic gauge everything. Measure it and mic it and make sure that I'm happy with the size. I've got the block cleaned up. Uh, I've got this commercial pressure washer here that takes about an hour, but I've put the block halves. Each half goes in this cleaner, which is a Varsol tank, and I clean the worst of it off, and then I give it the first coat, or the first coat, the first uh, run through the commercial parts washer, and that takes 90% probably off. Then I clean all the gasket surfaces up um, and make sure there's no no debris, no grit or anything else like that in it. And then give it one more hour in that parts washer and it heats this up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And then while it's still hot, take it out and I blow all the orifices out and all the water just evaporates almost instantly. And then I start to assemble. So I put the dowel pins in. You can see there's a dowel pin in here. Well, each one of these bearings has a dowel pin that, that keeps the bearing shell from, from moving, from turning in the block. I've still got a couple of sets of these 1.9 standard bearings left. They're really hard to get. I don't. Uh, most of my engines, of course, are 2.1s and bigger. We just finished a 2450cc stroker big valve. I'm just waiting for software, a chip to come from Tectonics Tuning to bring that to the next level. But it is a stump puller. And this will just go into a stock Westphalia, and it'll it'll work great. This will be uh, this will add 15 or 20 horsepower probably the way these are built. Um, I use my own heads, port and polish, uh, new valves. Sometimes I use AMC castings if I have them. This is just going to get regular uh, VW castings, but I clean up the ports so that they flow a little better. And of course, the big bore. You're getting up probably somewhere around 90 horsepower from 75, which is pretty reasonable. It's it's noticeable. You take your old War 19 engine out of your van, and uh, this certainly will. Um, It'll wake it up. You'll notice it right away. And if you don't drive it any harder, it'll be easier on fuel. So I mark all my bearings. I put a, a little sharpie, pop that bearing out of there. You see a little sharpie line that lines up at the seam. And that's for me. So when I assemble this engine, I'll be able to put the uh, bearings in and, and that'll locate that dowel pin so that it's not going to uh, squish the back of that bearing when I torque the case halves together. So I've done hundreds of these engines. Um, this is. 2021 I started in the mid 80s with Volkswagen and I've been working on these engines ever since and there's not a day goes by that there's not one on a stand I've got two more in the wings ready to go back on the stand so anyway I'll uh, get the crank in and maybe do another little video and show you what I'm up to anyway over and out crank is set the bearings all fit in their dowels perfectly Everything's lubed and a little bit of in play. You can make sure that the crank's not uh, not tight. Of course, these have a one piece um, rear main bearing, so it's a lot easier to set the thrust. Uh, not easier, just, just simpler, I guess. Um, this fellow right here, the reason I say it's simpler is because there's not a washer that has a tooth that you have to align before you put the case halves together and find a used one here. There's one right here. So this fellow here, that washer with the little tooth on the top of it, right there, has to align in a, in a spot in the case. And if it's not, it'll keep the case has from bolting together and the crank won't turn. Just bad things will happen. So I align the timing marks up. You can see there's a dot right there. Well, that is going to align when I turn this around. Let's turn this crank. Keep turning and turning and turning and turning, and you'll see there. You see how that lines? Well, it's hard to see. Gotta find some light. There we go. You can just barely see those dots. Anyway, that that tells me that my valve is going to open. 
at the right place when that crank comes up. And what else can I tell you about this? The bearings for the cam set into the block pretty well. I have the cam, it's a stock cam. Um, it's also polished by Nova and Dartmouth. And they measure it and check it for me and then I remeasure it after I get it home to make sure. But like I say, I've never had, to, never had any issue with any of their work ever. Not ever, not once, which is pretty good. Unlike the previous machine shop I was to deal with, which almost every second thing had to go back. And not that their work was shoddy, but it was just they'd forget to send a part back with me and I'd have to drive to their shop to get it or something that lost in their parts washer. It just was uh, difficult. So our next step is to um, put the other, really we can just bolt this together now, bolt the case halves together. So I always put the sealer on this side of the case um, still have to put a dowel and the other main bearing in, in here, which I'll do that here in a few seconds. But these little drain holes here and here are where the oil that sprays from the main bearing goes in the cavity. This is of course where the rear main seal goes and that fills that cavity with oil. And if it didn't have these vent holes, it would blow that seal out. And um, I've seen engines fix them before where somebody will seal this side of the case and then you really don't have an idea where this vent is you got to keep that sealer from being uh, filled in that spot and it'll pop that out there's one of course on the other end as well so if you seal put the sealer on this half you'll never have that issue never have to worry about it so i've had the pickup out blew it all out blew all the galleys out and uh, just got to put my cam bearings in cam plug and sealer and i'll bolt this together and torque it and uh, and that will be ready for pistons and cylinders so anyway step two coming up just as a side note to these uh this camshaft there's a, a number on the gear which indicates the um the backlash i guess we have to set between this this gear and this gear so this is set right now that there's just a hair just a, a actually it's a, a thousandth of an inch is what i want on that that you can just feel hear that ticking that's a little bit of backlash which is perfect so when you were if this was too tight when I would roll this cam back and forth it would lift the camshaft over the case so when I roll the crank back and forth this would pop that up and we've got to make sure that doesn't happen so and I also have to make sure that we don't have any more than that in backlash or else you'll uh, you'll hear that um, it'll actually come in a, in a rattle as it's idling or um, it'll end up being so the harmonics what will happen is it'll the oil pump is driven off the front of this camshaft there's a little slot in there change the light a little bit so my phone right there that slot that's in there that's what drives the oil pump and the harmonics of that bouncing back and forth if it has too much play will break the end of that off i've seen that twice in my career so you want to make sure that's a critical measurement so anyway moving on all right, so I started torquing the case halves, and this little fellow right here, this eight millimeter uh, nut, that's the first one we torque, and we torque that to 15. The 10 millimeter ones we take to uh, 33 on this one. This is a later 1.9 case. If this was an earlier 1.9 case, we'd torque the big ones to 26. Um, so I have just a simple setup. I put a little dollop of this sealant, this is this what I seal the case halves with. This is worth flame sealant, and it's an anaerobic sealer. Anaerobic means uh, without oxygen, obviously. So you can leave this puddle on here all day long. This is my, uh, just a marble slab that a friend of mine had given me for uh, checking the, the flatness, if you will, of, a, of an item or if a rod's bent or a cylinder head or just a great little tool, but I'll wipe this off after. And I just take a, a little bit of, of uh, sealant and I dab the washer I do this with two hands but the other hand is holding the telephone and uh, aka camera so I dab a little bit on there and then I take that washer oops now if I drop it on the floor oh it's even landed sealer side up which is nice and I drop that on that stud you can see this case is a little corroded on the outside but it's clean 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 we can paint this or just leave it I'll just leave it raw you can scrub that you can do whatever you want but you're never going to make it um, any better other than maybe cosmetically this would be what we call an economy rebuild so this uses uh, polished cam reconditioned rods um, 
Chinese, not that I'm a big fan of using the Chinese, but it's pretty much the only big bore one nine pistons and cylinders that I can buy. They're AA. Um, they're assembled in United States with Chinese and Taiwan made parts. Take it for how it is, but these engines are reasonably priced. They last a long time. They don't burn oil. And uh, I'm pretty pleased with them. I've, I've installed probably a few dozen sets of them already. And are there better ones? Sure. You know, we can buy my the rotating assemblies I buy from Go Westy are brilliant. I, the pistons are American made. They're, they're never have an issue with those engines. I've once again built dozens and dozens of those. My favorite one of those, of course, is a 2.2, but, um, and they, it's just the best, the best engine combo for reliability and uh, good power. And anyway, I'll get into a whole rant about that if I keep going. So anyway, let me finish torquing this case before, uh, it gets too long. We always, every time I torque a bolt, I give that engine a the crank a turn, make sure that it's it's everything's still turning free, and it is obviously. So now I'm ready just to to torque all of the eight millimeter ones. I'll put all these together now and keep on keep on going. All right, thanks for watching. These are the pistons I'm using. These are AA, made in China, United States, Taiwan, shipped to England, shipped to Canada, and then shipped to me. So they've been around a few miles on them. They're probably got more miles on them now than they ever will in the van. <laughs> Too funny, eh? So still have to seal these up. I've taken the pistons out of the cylinders already. And I make sure the end gaps on the rings are aligned. So I want them all at 120 degrees um, from each other. And that more or less, well, it just helps eliminate some of the oil consumption issues. These, I thought I had these staged so the way they fit in the van. But so this here you can see that arrow in there that's gonna that has to point towards the flywheel so this one here we have to turn this way that sits against the flywheel this is the way they sit in in the van actually the cylinder goes this way these two square bosses face each other so i have to turn this piston in the sleeve which is perfectly fine i'll get a tool for that now that it's in there and we're going to seal these up. So there's a green O-ring, which I have oodles of them over here. I, uh, there's probably a dozen or so. This black one goes on the bottom. So I take one of them, take another one of them, and I'll put that on the bottom. And I use a little bit of uh, dielectric grease or silicone lubricant just to hold them in place and ensure that they don't, uh, they don't dry out very quickly. Sometimes these engines sit a while after I build them. This one obviously is not. It's going to be installed probably tomorrow morning. And it'll be running by, tomorrow is uh, Wednesday, Thursday, about 10 o'clock in the morning. This will be on its maiden voyage. Um, I build them in this facility and then I take them to my other shop and my son installs them there. I've got a, a wonderful crew. There's uh, seven of us all together that work at that shop. And a lot of our work, about two thirds of our work are daily drivers, Jettas and Golfs. And the bulk of our of one and two other guys, which is myself and my son, are the vans. It's kind of our passion. I've been working on vans for uh, 30, oh, going on 35 years now. Can you believe that? Hard to imagine. I worked on these vans when they were brand new. So anyway, let me get these pistons installed and uh, maybe I'll set the camera up on a tripod so you can see me wrestling with that and then you get an idea of what I'm up to. Stand by. So that went pretty well. Uh, seals are on the bottom of those pistons. I just or on the bottom of the cylinders rather. I want to show you how this has to work. You can see this hole right here. You can see the barrel. That's that's the cylinder. That's this piece right here that we're looking at in this hole. That's a coolant jacket hole. Now, in order to install the snap ring on, on number two and number four piston, we have to install the wrist pin too. You can see you have to work through this hole. I'm trying to get this a light there we go you see the snap ring you can see the end of the wrist pin and that's in the small end of the connecting rod and that connects the piston uh, to the crank all together so then we slide the uh, the cylinder down that barrel slides down over the piston i put a little bit of oil in the cylinder wall just to uh, just for break in not a lot just a just a few drops here and there I just run my finger around that barrel and then I just slide this 
piston down till it seats. And then the very bottom of that's a little tricky to get. That's it. And that's all there is to it. So now what I have to do is put the green O-rings in these and then clean up my pushrod tubes. I already got them cleaned up and seals on them. They just have to be installed. The head gasket, this is the water jacket right here. There's still a gasket that goes on top of these cylinders, which is these fellows. I may as well get them down while I'm here. These have to go inside the cylinder head. These two aluminum washers. And I need two of these green O-rings. And once again, I also put some silicone grease on those and that just ensures that they don't rip or tear when the cylinder head slides over. So I'll put this back uh, on the tripod and do a little um, time lapse of what, what else I'm doing here. You need a lot less silicone than you think you need when you seal these head gaskets. A little tiny bit sticking out like this is just fine. Um, I stick to that 3mm, Bentley Ass for 3mm, and that's what I put on there. I won't put a, a bit more. Um, there's no need for it. Make sure you put a little silicone underneath the head nuts. A little trick that I do is these head nuts underneath the valve cover are going to look perfect like this all the time. So I take these four head nuts that are in here and move them outside just so that people can uh, can see those shiny bits I guess so I have a drawer full of these as you can see I've got I don't know how many of these I've taken apart over the years hundreds new shims for setting the end play I've got another room through that doorway over there underneath my sawmill which I keep in for inclement weather I've got probably uh, 50 cranks rods cam setups over there ready to go to the machine shop I've only got maybe a half a dozen cores left um, I'd buy cores if somebody that's listening to this video and of course with the pandemic I can't drive anywhere to get them but I'd like to speak for some anyway I've gone to the US a few times come back with a trailer load of engines so I can build and send on the way I do between 30 and 50 of these a year the next step for me is to adjust these valves and put the push rods in adjust the valves put the valve cover on and then this is done I'll drop a uh, distributor drive in it as well so I don't have to to worry about anybody messing with the timing let's uh drop the distributor in and turn the key and the way it'll go still have to set the end play as well so we're getting close another well we're in shooting distance now within uh 15 or 20 minutes there another 15 or 20 minutes there all together probably an hour and i'll have it done so i started this engine this morning about 7 30 this morning and that's uh after having the block cleaned i tidied that up yesterday it takes about an hour to strip it and then about another two or three to to clean it and prep it and then another hour the second time to clean it after you get the gasket surfaces to clean the gasket surfaces up and uh, to do this right I'm gonna guess about between eight and ten hours probably to do this but I've done a ton of them I know some guys make a winter project out of it but I do uh, my best year I think I've done over 75 in one year this year I'm probably gonna be uh, well, in the last calendar year maybe 30 or so so a few more to go before I get tired of it, that's for sure. Anyway, I'll, uh, I might have more to say here in a bit. I'll put my phone down and get to work. All right, I want to speak about Vanagon engines and engine swaps for a moment if I can. I'm not sure if I'm going to place this video before you guys see me rebuild an engine or after, but... I get a call a week, probably a couple of emails a week about people that are interested in having a Subaru swap or a TDI swap or a big bore Vanagon engine and they've all read on the internet about what's best for their van and really what they're hearing is opinions about other people's projects 
and not that there's anything inherently wrong with other people's projects and I think that people that are doing these um, especially people that are doing it for a living they've got a lot of it's a hard job to keep these old vans on the road a 30 year old van but let me give you a little history the Subaru swaps are I'm in this industry long enough now well over 30 years that I remember when when there was a real hard time to get reliable Vanagon engine parts. You couldn't buy injectors, you couldn't buy distributors, you couldn't buy um, power steering pumps even for a while. Um, cylinder heads, You, everybody that's, that can hear my voice I'm sure has heard of the issues with cylinder heads and cylinder head gaskets, which was uh, a real problem for a while as you can imagine. So anyway, on the bandwagon, 15 or 20 years ago, whenever this all happened, people decided that Subaru engines would fit under the lid with the engine closed, and they sure do. They make a fair amount of power, I agree with that as well. However, those engines, when you could roll the clock back, let me go back up. When you could roll the clock back to from 250,000 kilometers to go into a junkyard to buy in, buying a whole complete engine with ECU and uh, wiring harness and a fuel system and a power steering system and an alternator and everything you needed really to, uh, to hear an engine run, you could have that whole package purchased for let's say $1,200, maybe $1,500 for, uh, for a 2.2 back in the day. And it would give you everything you need from a Subaru car to bolt into your Vanagon, except the adapter plate, flywheel clutch, starter, that kind of business. Stock starter would do it, but there's been uh, improvements in the starter, of course. And then somebody had to make a harness and off to the races you went. And you rolled the clock back by a couple of hundred thousand kilometers. And it was a good idea. I, have no no debate in my mind that was a great idea and I to toyed with the idea of becoming a Subaru Vanagon install specialist but I stayed the course I went through a stage that uh, I started to install diesel engines in it just because my heart was in the Volkswagen and Volkswagen decided that they could uh, figure a way to put it su successfully put a diesel engine in Vanagon so I could use the parts that they had already and I've done over a hundred TDI swaps and diesel swaps over the years in vans and uh, some of the best of my knowledge they're still running some of the older engines are getting tired and really hard to find I think the last AAZ that I installed in a van for a gentleman in Ontario I really wish I wouldn't have I kind of got talked into that fitting into a budget um, I understand about budgets trust me but that van needed a TDI to meet his expectations and uh, that AAZ, which is a mechanical diesel, while it worked well for for a van that I drove, it, it's there's there's still there's still maintenance hungry. Anyway, back up the truck a bit. All that to say is, present day, even the last five years, eight years, I'd even go as far as to say ten years, you can buy reliable, even better than OEM van again aftermarket parts. Cylinder heads, besides the valves, we have them repaired way better than OEM heads. Um, you can buy internal engine parts from a company like Go Westy, of course. Everybody's heard Go Westy, and I know that some people have a lot to say, good or bad about Go Westy, but I'm telling you, there's not a van that I work on. And I work on as many as anybody in Canada, I would say. Um, we've got dozens of them all the time at the shop. There's likely not a van at any given time that doesn't have some Go Westy parts somewhere on that van and you can be grateful for them regardless of how you feel about that company but they make some wonderful parts they make the thermostat housing that fits on the back of this engine here all of the billet aluminum they've got some repair parts for power steering uh, hose kits and alternator bracket kits and they've really gone above and beyond to keep these beloved vans on the road and without them we'd be in trouble this is not a commercial for go whiskey i'm just saying that people think the only option they have is to take the water boxer engine out and install a Subaru engine or Boss Tig. And I've seen, I've seen every swap. There's not a swap I don't think that is commercially available today that you can buy that I haven't seen. Boss, uh, Boss Tig is a good one. Um, the Boxier uh, TDI swap is absolutely brilliant. It looks, looks beautiful. Um, but my favorite favorite van to drive is still the simpler the better Vanagon you can beef up the uh, water boxer engine to a 2.2 even um, and they've got reasonable power you can people take 
I mean, they, people have a lot of expectations for these old vans. They're not going to drive like the Lexus SUV somebody has in their yard, or my wife's Touareg, for instance. You're not going to be able to perform like those cars are going to perform. It just isn't going to happen. But if you keep your weight to a minimum and don't have tremendous expectations, these water boxer engines, if they're maintained properly, will last a long time. Years and years and years. Um, change the coolant every two years, read the manual that's that hopefully you have one that came with your van to tell you what the maintenance schedule should be and just stick to that maintenance schedule. Um, and these, these engines will treat you a long time. The big thing I have against swaps, and trust me, I, I own three diesel swapped vans, is let's say you put a Subaru engine in and you're traveling across Canada and you get somewhere in rural prairie provinces and you end up having some kind of a cooling system failure and who do you take it to? You take it to the Subaru shop, he's going to open the hood on this thing and look around and what is this thing? It's, it's I recognize it's a Subaru engine here, but the cooling system flows the wrong way. And what about the exhaust on that? Where did that come from? And they're just going to close the hood and send you to somewhere else. So, all right, well, there's a Volkswagen guy just 20 minutes from here. We'll, we'll limp it to them. And he opens it up. What? what? What's this thing? So unless you find some independent guy like myself that isn't afraid to tackle this stuff, and trust me, we've worked on tons of Subaru issues. Most of the issues we have with Subaru problems are head gaskets. Which people try to get away from by putting the Subaru engine in the first place, and electrical problems from somebody that wasn't quite sure how to work a crimping set of crimping pliers. Um, the harnesses are falling apart after a few years, and then typically it's the second or third owner that has done those um, done those swaps. If somebody calls me and asks about purchasing a van, one of the first pieces of advice I give them is stay away from OPC. OPC stands for Other People's Conversions. And if it's not a commercially viable part, if it's not a company, a reputable company that makes the swap and makes the parts and have been in business a while, I'm not so sure I'd be happy about driving that and wondering where the parts, the harness, or especially, at least at the very least, there should be a captain's log somewhere that somebody has documented all of the parts that it's a 2004 Subaru Forester 2.5 and this is the alternator that fits it and this is the fuel pump that we use with it and this is whatever. So that's that's at least at the very least I'd like somebody to see that. But there's really no reason to continue, in my opinion, installing the Subaru swaps. We don't need to be pushing these vans at, at uh, 120 kilometers an hour on the highway anymore or 70 miles an hour or whatever. That causes a lot of heat in transmissions and then you have to re-gear them and just exponentially causes problems. In my opinion, if you're in that big a hurry, you're in the wrong car, so you should take another vehicle to, the, to your relaxing vacation mode, but that's a rant for another time anyway. Anyway, I just wanted to, to clear some of the air up. Um, there are certain pluses to putting another engine in your van, and if you do it yourself and you're mechanically inclined enough to do that and to maintain it and keep it on the road, man, by all means, power to you. And there's lots of support, and there's all kinds of forums and groups that'll, that'll give you support, good or bad, that you'll get it. And I quietly lurk in the backgrounds on lots of these forums, and I can assure you firsthand, very firsthand, that a lot of the people that are telling you that they're doing what they're doing aren't doing what they're saying they're doing because, wait a minute, I know exactly what you're trying to say that you've never done what you're telling me you've done. So. This, this is going to work out so well for the guy that you're giving advice to. So Now, I'm not saying that's every case. I'm saying that's a lot of the case. But And there are some names that come up that have stellar reputations, and I, I would uh, I would take advice from them anytime and uh, appreciate them giving their knowledge away. So Anyway, I hope you uh, take some bit of advice from that. I've, uh, I've been around Vanigans a long time. I've owned dozens of them myself. I've got three high-powered TDI synchros, um, a single cab, a double cab, and a high top in uh, Westphalia that I've been all over North America in them. And this little industry of mine, this little business that I've been running for a few decades now has taken me to, to every province in Canada and, and most of the states as well, delivering vans, buying vans, picking up engines, parts. We've even shipped a van engine to Hawaii and I had the pleasure of of uh, my wife and I flying to Hawaii to install, install an engine in a van. So we've been, we've been everywhere, and I really enjoy it. So anyway, thanks for letting me ramble on. 
Um, this is at the tail end. I'm, I'm filming this now at the tail end of a, an engine assembly. It's 20 after 2 in the afternoon and it's minus 27 outside in the windshield. So I'm staying in here where it's warm today. I'm not going to be going outdoors to, to uh, cut any wood today. I might be more supposed to warm up to a balmy minus 6. Um, but, uh, that's all I have to say about that. Thanks for listening and I appreciate you watching my humble little channel. And I got a lot of stuff going on in here from firewood and sawmills and banding and engines and, and a few uh, videos for my business. So I'd appreciate it if you subscribe and uh, keep in mind we still have that giveaway coming up any day now. I've just got to stop being so lazy and pick a winner and mail away a, a gift card. So we're on the cusp of giving away a $100 prepaid visa card to some lucky subscriber to our channel. So please subscribe, like, and share it with your friends. Thanks again for watching. Over and over.